Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theater. Today's another special edition of Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio with our special guest, award-winning journalist Ray Kelly, owner and administrator of WellsNet, the resource credited by respected documentarians and authors as the leading online source of information about the life, career, and work of Orson Welles. Hello, Ray. I'm nice to be here. Thank you for having I'm me. So glad you're here with me today. Premiering at the Aldelphi Theater May 31st, 1946, Around the World is based on the 1873 Jules Verne novel Around the World in 80 Days and was the only Broadway musical ever created by the collaborators Colt Porter and Orson Welles as an eye-popping extravaganza with Welles not only writing, but producing, directing, and playing a featured role in the cast. The explosive production had as much drama happening off stage as on. So Ray, why don't you, uh, if you could take us to this moment in Orson Welles' career. This is obviously after Citizen Kane, but where, where was Welles' career uh, in the mid 1940s at this time? Okay, Michael, at, at, by the summer of 1946, uh, Wells had just witnessed the release of The Stranger. It was a thriller uh, starring Edward G. Robinson and Loretta Young. It was his first Hollywood directing job in four years. His career as a film director had been dealt a severe blow after RKO Pictures re-edited, actually butchered, his second film, The Magnificent Ambersons, in 1942. Uh, Wells had had tremendous success in radio and on Broadway in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. He had begun his career on the Dublin stage at the age of 16. I'm sure part of him wanted to revisit the stage, and he had never done a Broadway musical, as you noted. Mm -hmm. His mother had been a concert pianist in Chicago, and he had a keen appreciation of music and was a man of many talents and interests. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, Broadway musicals are born in, in many different ways. Sometimes they're adaptations, sometimes they're original. How did uh, Around the World uh, come that, that, that a collaboration would happen with two such improbable artists as Orson Welles and Cole Porter? Uh, well, Welles decided to make a musical out of one of his favorite childhood books, Jules Verne's Around the World in 80 Days, and he wanted an extravaganza. There were 38 sets, a three-ring circus on stage, uh, a train running through the American West, and four mechanical elephants. For this, he needed more than 50 stagehands to support it and a cast of about 70. Wow. And about 30 minutes of this was motion picture footage that he shot and integrated into the play. And the play had a running time of about three hours. Mm -hmm. In later years, Orson Welles would say that it was the theatrical work he was proudest of, which is something when you consider his success in the federal theater with Voodoo Macbeth or the Mercury's modern dress, Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. uh, the great Mike Todd was originally a backer, but he pulled out. Mm -hmm. So Welles sunk his own money into Around the World. And Welles borrowed money also from uh, Harry Cohn from Columbia Pictures and agreed in turn to star and direct in a movie for them which would turn out to be the lady from Shanghai mm -hmm. with his then wife, Rita Hayworth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, what was the working relationship? Do we know anything about the relationship between Cole Porter and Orson Welles in terms of this kind of a collaboration? Was this a good collaboration for the both of them? Yeah, I have to say, I'm really not well versed in that, though Welles was clearly a fan of yeah. Cole Porter's work. Uh, it's been reported that Welles went to Cole Porter and said, hey, I want to write a musical around the world in 80 days. I want to direct it. I'm going to be in it. Mm -hmm. uh, in his later years, he used a Cole Porter tune as temporary music for his last film, The Other Side of the Wind. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, Around the World was it's one of Porter's lesser scores that mm -hmm. it characterized his output in the 1940s until the success he had with uh, Kiss Me Kate in 1948. Right. Right. This was sort of a, a, a low period. For oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. And at the height of like really what was happening in, in, in the 1940s was the kind of explosion of Rodgers and Hammerstein, which who were bringing a very different kind of a show than what Cole Porter, I guess, mm -hmm. was really, you know, uh, accustomed to working. And it almost seemed like he didn't didn't know how to function in the theater at this time until, of course, like you're saying, Kiss Me Kate came along. And that wasn't um, until 48. Yeah. 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 So was this. Uh, 
Was this a, 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 a tumultuous uh, production process well, in the classic Orson Welles sense of the well, word? Well, yeah, it, it, the show began its pre-Broadway tryouts at the uh, Boston Opera House mm -hmm. uh, back in April 28th, late April. Uh, a little more than a week later, he moved it to the Schubert in New Haven. And then a week after that, they moved it to the Schubert in Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're looking at it. The we keep saying the Delphi Theater, Broadway, which was owned by the Schuberts, mm -hmm. and it moved there at the tail end of May. Mm -hmm. uh, it lasted just seventy-five performances. It closed on August third, nineteen forty-six. Yeah, yeah, not a not a very long run, even. By no, those. not 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 at all. Um, you know, we talk about the audience reaction to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. By um by all accounts. It was a crowd pleaser, yeah. but the Adelphi did not have a really great air conditioning system. Mm. And so this play, you know, was, the production was slow getting off the ground, getting moving. It opens up on Broadway. We're talking, you know, Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, and we weren't seeing theater goers. We're not happy in June and July, in late June. The initial crowds were good, but... By July, you know, you're having this very, very expensive show. I told you the size of it, um, experiencing a reduced audience in the summer months, and it, it couldn't it couldn't keep up. Wells lost uh, more than 300000 that he had invested out of his own pocket into the show. Wow. Wow. And I think that, that your, your point in terms of, of it being summer, uh, you know, it speaks to what's so unique about this particular broadcast to me is that the show was actually playing on Broadway when they made this way radio recording. So right. it, it was almost like an advertisement to try to get people it's into Exactly. The exactly. Yeah. You're hundred percent right. I'm sure Wells saw it as a half hour commercial for his yeah. Broadway show. Because yeah. at the same time, Wells was doing Around the World on Broadway. He was producing, directing, writing, presenting, co-starring in this anthology radio series, the Mercury Summer, Summer Theater yeah. uh, on the air. For, and for that show, this debut episode was this uh, broadcast you have, which was June 7th, 46, right. which he heavily abridged because the Mercury Summer Theater was just a half hour format. Right. You know, so we're talking three hour show. So obviously only a handful of songs made it into this 30 minute cut. Yeah. Uh, I believe I, say, I believe um, this is the only cast recording of Porter's Around the World score. You're right. I, I mean, I've never heard of anything. Mm -hmm. This is uh I, but but uh, but additionally, what makes this, I think, so valuable is that you actually also get to hear the performances, not just the music itself, but right. actually you get to experience that Broadway cast and and hear the, the songs and the scenes. Well, let's do that right now. So here on the June 7th, 1946 episode of the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air are from the original Broadway cast, Arthur Margotson as Phileas Fogg, Larry Lawrence as Passepartout, Julie Warren as Molly Muggins, Mary Healy as Mrs. Aouda, and Orson Welles as Dick Fix in Around the World. Good evening. This is your obedient servant, Orson Welles, your producer of a special series of broadcasts, a festival of your favorite radio dramas, presented by the makers of Pab's Blue Ribbon Beer. The Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Tonight and every Friday night, Pat's Blue Ribbon presents you with a front row seat in one of the greatest plays ever produced on Broadway. So while America's famous producer, writer, director, Orson Welles, entertains you, pour yourself a tall, frosted glass of Pat's Blue Ribbon and enjoy at the same time great theater and this truly great beer. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Summer theaters are among the most genial of all theatrical institutions. The atmosphere is pure holiday for everybody on both sides of the curtain, and it's just in that spirit that we of the theater begin, the Mercury Theater, begin tonight a summer festival of revivals. Plays and stories we've done more than once before because you've told us more than once you like them. Tonight it's one of the first things we ever put on the radio, and by no coincidence whatsoever, it's the very latest thing we put on the stage. You can see it now on Broadway at the Adelphi Theater, Sunday evenings included. And if you're one of our staunchest friends, you'll remember it from among the first Mercury broadcasts. 
many an eventful year before Cole Porter put the whole slam-bang, she-bang to music for us. His music, a portion of it, makes up the main part of this evening's entertainment. A half hour really isn't time enough for the story alone. This being what it is, a gaudy old melodrama from our youngest days with equal parts of plot and plush. So take it, if you please, with a smile and our warmest compliments for the warm season. Here it is, then, minus many scenes and much mileage with a hop, skip, and a jump around the world in 80 days. It's the year 1872. A bank has just been robbed. A certain Mr. Dick Fix, a sort of stool pigeon, a private detective, an ugly customer, enacted this evening by your obedient servant, is busy leading the London police in a frantic search for the bank robber, who is, if truth were known, Dick Fix himself. The opening scene is in Hyde Park, and involved in it are a lackadaisical Yankee, Mr. Passepartout, and a young Irish nursemaid named of Molly. These besides fix himself. All right there, all right. Hold him, boys. Hold him there now, then. See anything of this bank robber, you? No, sir. Who are you, sir? Dick Fix, the copper's knock, and these men with me are police. Now then, you, your name, residence, and place of occupation. Me? Well, I've been sleeping in the park. Residence, Hard Park, means a livelihood. I am a sailor, but I miss my ship. I'm stranded. Please, sir, this young gentleman couldn't have anything to do with any bank robber. How do you know? He's been right here in the park with me these past two hours. Nursemaid, ain't you? How come you know this man? Well, sir, we haven't been formally introduced, but we have been sort of passing the time of day. Boys, you got the wrong man, but don't fear I'll get the right one if I have to search the old of London from Tooting back to Putney Green. Come along, men! Thanks, lady. Thanks for standing up for me like that. So you missed your ship, sailor man. However, did that happen now? I overslept. Hey, look here in the grass. Look what I found. A half a dollar, a half a crown, you call it. That's lucky. That's what you need, a job. And I know where you can get one. A job? In the flat below where I work. A gentleman needs a gentleman's gentleman. Could you be a valet? Nothing to it. Sure, I'm lucky. Just meeting you, Miss, uh, Miss... Uh, Muggins. A Muggins? Molly Muggins. Uh, the pleasure's mine, I'm sure. Molly. Golly. So wrong seemed the world, I faced it with rage. Why hopeless I whirled like a mouse in a cage. Till hill came and rained, not that life was worth, then presto change. is one minute, 27 seconds slow. This is your new valet, sir. I'm pleased to meet you. Indeed. And what is your name? Passepartout. Passepartout. My father was French. That can be overlooked. My friends call me Pat. That shouldn't be necessary. Give me my hat and stick. I'm off to the whist club. From this moment, two minutes after 11 o'clock a.m., this Wednesday, October the 2nd, 1872, you are in my service. You will wake me at eight each morning to the toll of St. James's chimes with tea and toast, but important most, a heated copy of the Times. A slightly undone copy of the London Times. At 11.29 precisely, I depart from the club each day. So your orders are pat to be positive that I am dressed in an elegant way. For although it is of no interest to me, 
if I please either damsel or dame. Tis a matter of pride as the speech I stride to hear all the ladies exclaim. To hear the ladies all exclaim. There he goes, Mr. Phileas Fogg, setting every girly agog. Wouldn't he make a marvelous mate? Never early, never late. There he goes, that smart Mr. Phileas, in his clothes so pick a dick a dillious. What a dude, what a dapper old dog. There he goes, Mr. Phileas Fogg. There he goes, there he goes, there he goes. Well, 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 well. Scotland Yard has come to me to old Dick Fix. The coppers knock to help them find the bank robber. Little do they guess the bank robber is me, but I'll mislead them. I'll pin the job on this here Phileas Fogg and get the reward for doing it, because I plays it two ways. That's why they calls me Double Dealing Dick. <laughs> Gentlemen, fellow members of the Whisk Club, I bid you good evening. Oh, good evening, Fogg. Well, Jeopardy, what about that robbery in your bank? Blasted spry of you, Fogg, I must say, getting your money out before the theft. We are offering a handsome reward for the bandit's arrest. Reward or no, I say the chances are all in his favor. There is not a single country where the thief could hide. Sure, well, this is big enough. It was, formerly. How formerly? <laughs> Has the world grown smaller, perchance? Much smaller, my dear sir, since we can now circle the globe in 80 days. I'll wager 4,000 pounds such a journey is impossible. I accept. You mean, sir, to circle the globe? In 80 days? In 80 days, and I'm willing to bet 20,000 pounds, I'll do it. 20,000? <laughs> which an unforeseen delay may make you lose? The unforeseen does not exist. The Dover train leaves at 8.45 tonight. I will take it. Today is the 2nd of October. I will be back in London in this very salon of the Whist Club on Saturday, the 21st of December at 8.45 o'clock in the evening. 20,000 pounds? Well, Mr. Fogg, yes. I'll meet the bet. Compose yourself, my dear Chevity. This isn't serious. <laughs> my dear Sir Charles, we are Englishmen. And when an Englishman makes a bet... It is always serious. Open up in there. Open in the name of the Queen. If you don't open, I'll break down the door. Before you start breaking any doors, Dick, what evidence have you got against this here Phileas Fogg? Well, Chief, he answers the bank robber's description. Does he? He's going to if he don't now for the door, man. One, two, three. Hey, thrown the tooth. Through the back way, boys, after him and off it now. But wait a bit, the gas. He left the gas burning. That means he's coming back. But when? Eighty days? In eighty days, Mr. Fogg? It does seem a short time, but I'm confident we'll do it. Seems like a long time to me. How's that? Well, sir, we were so rushed leaving London, I forgot to turn off the gas. Very well, young man. The gas will burn for eighty days. At your expense. Special agent reporting to Scotland Yard. The bank robber Phileas Fogg left Brindisi at high noon on the mail packet Mongolia for Suez, Egypt. Rush warrant, rush reward. Meantime, I'll dog his footsteps, using all possible ruses to delay his journey. Excuse me, sir. Yes, ma'am? Could you tell me when the next boat sails? Bound eastward, ma'am? How far? As far as possible. I'm going after my intended... And it needs must be. I'll follow him around the world. Well, Passepartout, we are now in British India. Well, one half day ahead of schedule. Look, Mr. Fogg, the train has stopped. So it has. You are the train conductor? I am that. We've come to a halt. Why? Where are we? At the hamlet of Colby in the great Indian forest. And why, pray, do we not continue? The railway isn't finished yet. The buy ticket reads Bombay to Calcutta by sir, rail. Sir, there won't be any more rail for three months. I shan't be able to wait. Mr. Fogg, what would you say to an elephant? I don't know. What does one say to an elephant? 
Oh, I see what you mean is, by all means, let us purchase such a beast. My man, I don't speak your lingo, but I desire to rent your elephant. I trust you know sufficient English to negotiate. What do you ask? For my elephant, Sahib, 80 rupees. 80 rupees, I say. Isn't that a trifle still? 80 rupees. I'll give you 20. 70. 30. 60. 40. 50. 60. 70. 80. 90. You drive a hard bargain, sir, but it's a deal. Wire urgent, special agent fixed to Scotland Yard in following fog disguise, cleverly as Parsi Mahout. With valid passport to the bank robber is proceeding towards Calcutta through the great Indian forest by way of little known and dangerous territory of Bundelkund by elephant. Why does the beast pause? The elephant pauses because she senses danger. Ah, gentlemen. You may well rue the day you ventured so far into the mountain fastnesses of Upper Bundelkund. I hear savage music. The song of Kali, goddess of death. Behold, Sati. Sati? What's that? The sacrifice by fire. There comes the procession. Looks like some kind of funeral. Who is the deceased? Auda, a wealthy prince of the neighborhood. Behold, they are bringing his body to the funeral pyre. And there, there comes his young widow. Her husband's corpse will be cremated and she will be put to the flames by his side. Burned alive? A native custom. But how could it be that such foul practices still are countenanced? Where is the beneficent hand of our British Empire? Where are we now? The pagoda of Pilachi. See, there is the funeral pyre. They are placing the Princess Aouda beside her husband's corpse. And lo, here come the priests with torches. The fires have started. Look, look there. I can't. It's too horrible. See the corpse. The corpse of the old prince himself. He's there. (gasps) The corpse rises to its feet. How can this be? He takes the girl into his arms. He brings her towards us. Let us flee. No, no, wait, wait. That, that isn't an Indian. An Englishman, an Englishman in disguise. And here is the princess, the beautiful Aouda. I am she. And whom have I to thank for this? Fog, madam. Phileas Fogg. My master! I knew it. Knew what? It is not true what my people say about the British. Dear Mr. Fogg, you are a man of heart. Occasionally, my dear madam. Occasionally. When I have the time. Special agent fixed to Scotland Yard urgent. And with bank robber traveling by boat with Yankee accomplice and Indo girl companion, Fogg is presently on the high seas some 300 miles northeast of Singapore. Evening, miss. You're the Indo girl, ain't you? You don't know me, but I know you, Mrs. Aouda, feeling a bit homesick for India. Indeed not. It would be worth my life to return You may have to after I get Mr. Phileas in Hong Kong. What do you mean? Here he comes now. Well, Mr. Fogg, so you finally come out of your cabin for a bit of air. A pretty night out, ain't it? I don't think we've been introduced. Oh, by the by, Mrs. I, should you find yourself a bit short of the ready, come to old Dick Fix, a copper's knock, for I'll be rich when I get to, you know, who in Hong Kong, rich beyond the dreams of avarice. Why are you British people so greedy for money? Money cannot buy you happiness. I know, but I like to have it around so I can choose the type of misery that's most agreeable to me. <laughs> well, I'll leave you lovebirds to enjoy the moon together. Nighty night. I trust that person has not made himself offensive to you. He frightens me. The evening is warm, madam, but you are shivering. With you to guard me, Mr. Fogg, to be fearful is an ungrateful passion. The moon is very lovely. Mrs. Aouda, that is your name, is it not? It is. Mr. Aouda... I have no interest, madam, in your late husband, nor indeed in you. I am, to be frank, a bachelor, and will see you to safety as such. My meaning is clear? It is. Good night, Mr. Fogg. Madam, good night to you.
Mary Healy, ladies and gentlemen, singing Cole Porter's great new song, Should I Tell You I Love You, which brings us to the first act curtain of Around the World. In the Mercury Summer Theater cast tonight, straight out of the Mercury Broadway production, are Mr. Arthur Margotson, who plays the punctilious Mr. Phileas, Miss Julie Warren, who is Molly Muggins, Mr. Larry Lawrence, who is Pat Patu, and among others, the villain of the piece, who is also its producer, your obedient servant. We'll get back to work in just a minute, but now it's intermission. And in any summer theater, time for a stroll out on the terrace, a breath of the fragrant June night, a smoke, some friendly conversation, and a nice frosty glass of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. Nothing left. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Hairbreath Ken Roberts in the nick of time and right on cue to tell you while we fix our scenery for the second half of Around the World about a world of flavor in 33 fine brews. There most certainly is a world of flavor in Pabst Blue Ribbon. The kind of flavor which makes a fellow smack his lips and say, this is it. Not too light, not too heavy. This truly great beer has a fresh, clean, real beer taste all its own. You see, every single drop of Pabst Blue Ribbon is the happy result of blending. The full flavor blending of never less than 33 fine brews. That's right. Never less than 33 fine brews blend their individual taste tones to give you a blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. If occasionally these days your dealer can't supply you with all the Pabst Blue Ribbon you'd like, well, keep on asking. For every single bottle you do get will live up to the same high standards of quality and taste. Yes, every bottle will be, as always, blended, splendid, Pabst Blue Ribbon. Hi, this is Porchlight Marketing Manager Austin Packard. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration and hope you enjoy the show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, around the world, part the second. For purposes of time and radio, we skip ahead some 8,000 miles and some 60 of the 80 days in which, according to his solemn wager with the Whist Club, Mr. Phileas Fogg, in the year of our Lord, 1872, has undertaken to circumnavigate the globe. With Mr. Fogg is, of course, the Hindu princess, Mrs. Aouda, lately rescued from the funeral flames, and Stati, you remember, in Upper Bundelkund, and his valet, Pat Paspatou, and an honest nursemaid of the old sod known as Molly Muggins. Because we're somewhat pressed for time this evening, we permitted Miss Muggins to catch up with Mr. Pat Patu, whom she greatly admires, during the intermission. The entire party is at this moment in one of the furriest sections of the American Wild West. Precisely speaking, in the Wasatch Mountains, advancing by train toward the perilous pass of Medicine Bow. To thicken the plot a bit for you, if possible, it's coming up for a blizzard. <laughs> You, sir. You are the train conductor? I'm Jake. Jake, the engineer. Bridge over the pass is gone or almost gone. We're going to have to spend the night here. Cannot the river be crossed in a boat? Raining too hard, snowing too bad, blizzard too awful, cricks all swole up like a horse with a green apple colic. Be that as it may, I suggest that we pass over the bridge first. Over the bridge? And I'm willing to pay double fare for every soul on board this train if you, sir, Mr. Engineer, will undertake to chance it. On the bridge? On the bridge. With our train? With our train. But the bridge threatens to fall. Yeah, the brave thing won't hold. It won't hold. She's a teetering and a tottering right now. I believe that by rushing the train over at its maximum of speed, we'll have some chance of passing. What is your estimate? Oh, 50-50. 50-50, an excellent risk. Let us proceed. Onward, 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 ever onward, Fog's train hurtles toward the rickety bridge, spanning the awesome gorge at Medicine Bow. Now, Jake, the engineer, as it may already have been ascertained, is nothing more than another aspect of the protean Mr. Fix. Fix of the thousand faces, Dick Fix, the coppers knock, still dogging Fog's footsteps around the world. Since your obedient servant is portraying this unsavory character, imagine yourself in the red-hot cabin of the engine, thundering towards the past. The salmon pink mustachios and red nose are those of Jake the Engineer, but the thoughts, the thoughts are the black thoughts of fix the copper's knock. <laughs> old, old double dealing dick yourself. It's my game to slow up Fogg until the Warren comes from London so as I could get me the reward by pinning my crimes on him. But now, 
Now he's forcing me to cross this bleeding bridge, and after what I did to it... After what I did to it, I doubt if I can. There comes the bridge now. God help us. If she doesn't hold... She's a teetering and a tottering. There goes the bridge. It fell just behind us. Safe. Safe at last. the scene changes to England, the city of Liverpool, some three short weeks later. My friends, I have gone around the world in 80 days, plus four hours and five minutes. I have lost... There he is, boys. Nab him. Who are you, sir? A police inspector. Mr. Fogg, you are wanted for bank robbery. I arrest you in the name of the Queen. At long last, Mrs. Aouda, who so dearly loves Mr. Fogg, gains admission to his dank cell in the Liverpool jail. Madam, will you pardon me for having brought you to England? I, Mr. Fogg? Oh, please be kind enough to allow me to finish. When I rescued you, I was rich and counted on placing a portion of my fortune at your disposal. But now, I'm ruined. However, I ask your permission to dispose of the little I have left in your favor. Thank you for calling, and goodbye. Mr. Fogg, do you wish at once a relative and a friend? Will you have me for your wife? Aouda. Phileas. Pass but who? Coming, Mr. Fogg. Find me a minister of the Church of England. We expect to be married. Married? Ask the Reverend to step round here tomorrow. Tomorrow? Tomorrow, Monday. Tomorrow, Sunday. Nonsense. That's right, Phileas. Today is Saturday. I've made my first miscalculation. If today is Saturday, my friends are waiting for me in the London Whist Club. And you've just got three hours and ten minutes left. Three hours, nine minutes, and 35 seconds. The sound of whistling, the whistling, indicates the pursuit by the English police of Dick Fix, whose true identity as the bank robber is revealed just in the nick of time, just in time to release Fogg from jail. And the scene now changes to London... And the whisk club. I believe the cop was the slip. Now then, now for a word with these fine gentlemen of the whisk club. Uh, good evening. Good evening, sirs. Who are you, sir? I'm poor old double dealing Dick himself, and I, I've double dealt myself out of the entire deal. I've bribed armies, blown up bridges, and what's it got me? No boodle, no carpet bag, no reward. But I have slowed up old Phileas for you, and... That's your bet, and I would like my share of the winnings. We'll talk to you, sir, after we've won the bet. But you've won it already. We haven't, but we're just about to. He has 14 seconds left. Ah, no, 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 no. Fogg lost a day. No, sir. He gained a day. He traveled eastward. Eastward toward the sun. The international date line. He has nine seconds left. Eight, seven, six, six five... five. Four, three, two. two. Gentlemen, I am here. Fogg. And Mrs. Fogg. No ladies. No ladies allowed in the whist club. Sir, this is no lady. This. No, no. No, no. The police, hot on his trail, Dick Fix, makes off into the night, leaving the lovers, Pat and Molly, Mrs. Aouda, and Mr. Phileas Fogg to celebrate the remarkable journey made in the year 1872 around the world in 80 days. Orson Welles will be back in just a few seconds to tell you about next week's production of the Mercury Summer Theater. But first, the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon 
wish to remind you that, though you may not be able always to get Pabst Blue Ribbon beer every time you want it in these days of grain restrictions, it is well worth your while to keep asking, for every bottle you do get will continue to live up to its name. There will be no cutting of corners, no lowering of standards of flavor or goodness, no compromise with quality. This truly great beer will be, as always, the happy blending of never less than 33 fine brews. As always, blended, splendid, Paps Blue Ribbon. Now, here is Orson Welles. Next week, ladies and gentlemen, we, we take our tongue almost entirely out of our cheeks and bring you a great romance, a really great romance and an old favorite of ours, The Count of Monte Cristo. At the same time next week, same station. Please join us. Until then, speaking for my sponsors the makers of Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, and all of us in the Mercury Theater. I remain, as always, obediently yours. This program came to you through the courtesy of the Pabst Brewing Company of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Makers of blended, splendid Pabst Blue Ribbon. CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. So that was the Orson Welles Cole Porter production of Around the World on the Mercury Summer Theater of the Air. Uh, let's talk, Ray, a little bit about that. What is the Mercury... I mean, I know the Mercury Theater of the Air and Orson Welles' work as uh, one of the great radio artists, but what was this particular show in comparison to other things that he was doing? I think it was an attempt to recapture those glory days of the late 1930s of the Mercury Theater on the Air in the Campbell Playhouse. Uh, those shows were hour-long shows. In my opinion, they, they were far meatier. The Mercury Summer Theater, while entertaining, was Wells' last uh, U.S. radio series. Uh, he uh, would do some work over in England. He did The Adventures of Harry Lyme and some other work. But uh, this was kind of the farewell for him on U.S. radio. Mm -hmm. And he did a number of uh, revivals, didn't he, on this one? He, he kind of harkened back to a number of his favorite episodes from, from the original Mercury Theater series on this one, right? Right. And he, you know, he would bring in his, 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 uh, gang of loyal supporters. And, and it was a short lived series though, for the most part, it was a summer series. It wasn't meant to be long-term. I think it was, uh, primarily meant to be an entertaining vehicle, a little cash in the pocket that he, that he surely could use and reinvest into around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was, he did that throughout his career, even in the early days of the Mercury theater in New York on stage, Wells did radio work mm -hmm. to, uh, subsidize his, his, his uh, productions. Mm -hmm. He was very much always an independent artist in that sense. And that's probably right. why he didn't do so well in the studio system, but he frequently used his work to finance his work. Right. And I think uh, the Mercury Summer Theater is an example of that, uh, making some money to pay the bills and to put into something like around the world. Mm -hmm. Do you feel, I mean, for somebody who at this time was, was doing films, doing radio on stage, did he have a favorite medium, do you think? I, I, Oh, film. I, 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 you know, he, he has, there's a wonderful line. I'm going to mess up the paraphrasing, but it's essentially that, you know, he would have been far more successful had he stayed in the theater. There, mm -hmm. And he has no doubt of that, that he would have been far more successful, but he fell in love with films and, mm -hmm. you know, he stayed loyal to it. And he put, he spent a lot of his life hustling for money because one can write a book alone in front of a typewriter and you can do a lot of things, uh, artistically that are much cheaper than filming a motion picture back in the forties, fifties, and sixties. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it, I believe it's referred to a very expensive paint box. Right. Right. 
So it's not unusual these days to see revivals of shows that maybe in their time in their original production uh, were not as successful with audiences. Maybe they were a bit ahead of the time or, or for any variety of reasons. That doesn't mean that they were a bad show and we rediscover them many years later. Around the World it, for being a Cole Porter and Orson Welles collaboration surprisingly is not a show that has been revived very much. Why do you think that is? It's 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 a very expensive production. And frankly, Wells had uh, spoken with people in England, Alexander Corda and others, about bringing this show after its U.S. run, bringing it over to England, where they felt it would be very successful. Uh, but the British trade unions would not allow Wells to use U.S. built sets and props. Mm. And so that meant starting again from scratch, Right. In terms of stage and stuff, they're just cost prohibitive. Mm -hmm. So with that, it faded into history. Now, a semi-staged production took place a decade ago in England and got fine reviews. And uh, but that's that's where we left off with that. It was uh, a, a potential backer. A few years ago, I was contacted by someone who was interested in a new production of this. They were looking for some historical data and asking me to do a little digging for them. And they had some interest in it, but nothing ever came of it. It's a very expensive proposition. Also, I mean, I'm not sure how much the, there's two estates to deal with. You deal with Wells' estate, but you'd also be dealing with the Cole Porter estate mm -hmm. uh, for the rights to the songs. Since then, you're going to, you know, get that lined up before you embark on a show that's going to ask you to create 38 sets and film and it, it's a big undertaking for something that i think we all agree is not cole porter's finest work mm -hmm. you know um i had someone else talk to me once that they were interested in acquiring the rights to the musical without the cole porter songs mm. and talking about someone else composing new songs for it now i think that really lowers the appeal to me right. of a revival completely i don't think that works right but uh so people have kicked it around this has gotten mentioned but there's been more interest in this in england than in the u.s in terms of doing semi-stage productions or recitals on it mm -hmm. and without the hand of orson wells directing it you know i i think it's one of those things that you're you're never really going to be able to fully experience exactly exactly and I, I know you, you know, the reception that the show got, it's very interesting because it had its flaws. It, you know, this is this was not, you know, a, a perfect masterpiece, the quintessential American musical. Life magazine called it the most overstuffed conglomeration of circus, magic, movies, old fashioned spectacle and penny peep shows that Broadway has seen since <laughs> the day of Barnum. OK, uh, and it and they and they noted that the score was disappointing and that mm -hmm. it was cluttered with more junk than gems. Mm -hmm. You know that was said. One of my favorite uh, stories about Wells is that after a noted Broadway critic, critic uh, Robert Garland, he had written that around the world had everything but the kitchen sink. <laughs> the next night, Wells had a kitchen sink brought out on stage during the curtain <laughs> speech. That's amazing. That's amazing. And that makes you, that gives you the appetite to want to get a time machine and go back and see Absolutely. the show in a way that you can. Ray Kelly, I'm so glad that you joined me today. Uh, I, I really appreciate your insights and well, your thank knowledge you for having me, Michael. in all things uh, Orson Welles. Theaters across the country need your support now more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio, I'm Michael White.